Okay, and hi Year 10 students. We are going to be starting our analysis today at the top of page 19. Um, where we left off, um, they're going around the jury room, each juror from number 1 um, up to 12, um, basically giving their reasons why they think the boy on trial is guilty. And we've hit number 8, and number 8 has said, well, I didn't expect a turn that you guys, I thought you were supposed to be convincing me. Um, wasn't that the idea? And they kind of debate it. So what happens here in this section is um, the foreman says, oh, yeah, I forgot. And then Jura 10 has an argument with them in this section. He's like, what's the difference? Let's hear what he has to say. And they go back and forth. Um, and the foreman, you can see, he clearly feels really attacked by Jura 10. And he tries to um, give up the responsibility of being the leader of the jury. He says, oh, look, I'm trying to keep this thing organized. You want to do it? Here, you sit here. You take the responsibility. Oh, just shut up. That's all. Um, so I've just made some notes that there's, he's angry. There's an attacking tone and clearly defensive um, and Jura 10's like, what? What's you getting so hot about? Well, don't tell me to calm down here. Here's the chair. You keep it going smooth and everything. Come on, Mr. Foreman. Let's see how great you'd run the show. Um, and one of the notes that I've seen on Jura, on the first Jura or the foreman of the Jura jury is his ineffectual leadership. He's reactive, um, sensitive about his perceived criticisms of his leadership of the jury. He's not really like commanding or taking charge of the jury, but being led by some of the other stronger personalities in the jury room. Um, anyway, that little interaction keeps, um, like continues, and, and then we move on. And Jura 8 then um, says, his piece it says it uh, provides his reasons or the beginning of his reasons he says look i don't have anything brilliant i need to know as much as you do according to the testimony the boy looks guilty maybe he is um and he says look everyone sounded so positive that he got a really peculiar strange feeling that nothing's that positive Basically, Jura 8, he's not saying the boy's guilty. He's just not sure. He's got questions that he wanted to ask. And he started to feel feel that they, the lawyer wasn't doing his job properly. Um, and he says it's also possible for a lawyer to be just plain stupid, isn't it? Now, something later on is mentioned, he's a court-appointed lawyer which means he's actually not a lawyer um, a lawyer that you pay for, but you get appointed one if you can't afford a lawyer. Um, so it's like a free lawyer. And um, so he's basically saying, look, there's one alleged eyewitness and somebody else heard the killing and then saw the boy running out afterwards, but it's actually – those two witnesses with the entire case and he says look supposing they're wrong and everyone's uh, sort of confused by that what do you mean supposing we're wrong what's the point in witnesses at all could they be wrong and Jura 8's point here is that they're only people people make mistakes that the um and and one of the concepts that Reginald Rose is trying to get um, across here is that fallibility of eyewitness testimony um, and that um, that people witnesses should be held accountable for their testimony that they um, they could our people they could make mistakes he's not saying that they are deliberately lying misleading but they could just make mistakes um, and so that's one of the points that um, Reginald Rose is getting at. Um, then we keep going and they talk about the knife. Uh, so the evidence of this switchblade knife. And that the boy bought on the night of the murder. 
And so the foreman brings in the switchblade knife and um, they discuss the evidence of the knife. Uh, and so the idea is, the putting the facts together, Jura 4 is here, um, say, okay, he go, and he lists them very logically in order. He was punched several times or hit. The date's Jura corrects him. And then he went out to this shop, a junk shop, like a second-hand shop, where he bought a switchblade knife. Um, and it was a special knife. It had an ordinary, sorry, it had an unusual carved handle. It wasn't an ordinary knife. And they said it was rare, the only one he'd ever had in stock. And so the boy at 8.45 went into his friends and he was showing off the knife and he was chatting them um, and those friends each identified the um, the knife in court as the same knife. Um, he claims, um, so he went home at about 10 o'clock and he says, um, he claims that he stayed home until 11.30 and so the boy claims that then he went to an all night movie. Um, came home about 3.15, his father was dead and um, he then got arrested. Um, and he, in the Jura 4, calls the story of the boy a fable, which is a fictional story, or a tale. Um, and the boy says that it fell through a hole in his pocket at some stage. And no one in the theatre identified him. Nobody, um, like... But he couldn't remember the name of the pictures he saw um, and the knife is brought in um, there were no fingerprints on the knife by the way so the knife is brought in and the idea that the boy like the, the coincidence it would be I guess if it really fell through, the knife really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket. Somebody had picked it off the street, went to the boy and stabbed his father with the same knife. Um, and the other you're saying, look, I'm just saying it's possible. The boy lost the knife and somebody else stabbed his father with a similar knife. And the fourth juror says, take a look at the knife. I've never seen one like it. It's a pretty incredible coincidence and Juror 8 keeps asserting that it's possible and Juror 3 saying it's not possible and the stage directions here indicate the 8th Juror who reaches into his own pocket, withdraws a knife, um, holds it in front of his face, flicks open a blade and um, sticks the knife into the table. So there's two knives exactly alike and everyone is shocked. Um, so the juror's like, what's the same knife? Where did it come from? Hey, what are you trying to do? Juror 8 explains that he went walking a couple of hours and walked through this boy's neighborhood and he actually found this knife from a pawn shop and it cost $6. Um, and juror 8, that's right, I broke the law. So it's against the law to buy and sell switchblade knives. Even this, I wonder, it makes me think about Jura 8's character, that he is presented as somebody that's noble, upstanding, courageous, the voice of justice, but he broke the law. And perhaps Rose is indicating that in order for justice to truly be served, it may be required for us to bend the rules. I don't know. That's a hyper, um, a hypothetical. Um, but... Uh, they do, they, the jurors are pretty much united in the fact that it would be an incredible coincidence um, to be stabbed with that same knife. Um, like the odds are a million to one. Juror 8 says it's possible but not very probable. And that distinction between possible and probable is really, um, is, I guess, really interesting um, and one that, the jurors explore later on and then the second juror remarks how interesting it is the third juror is like what it's not interesting um the kid apparently claims he bought the knife as a present for a friend of his um and he was going to give it to him the next day because he had broken the other kid's knife um 
and a friend did testify that the boy had broken the knife. Um, and the fact that though the juror three says that three hour uh, three weeks before he broke the knife, and, and it just happens that a half hour after his father smacked him, three and a half hours before he was murdered, he happened to buy it. Um, and then Dura eight um, questions: Why was he showing this knife to his three friends if he was planning on killing it? And they say, look, the boy lied. He was telling a story about all of this. Dura 8, he may have lied. Um, and a, there's a crack beginning to appear. Dura, the fifth Dura says, well, I'm not sure. He breaks off and looks nervously around. And other Duras start to jump on him. What? You're not sure about what? Now, what are you, the kid's lawyer or something? Are you cross-examining us? Well, isn't that what's supposed to happen in a jury room? Aren't we supposed to be questioning, cross-examining? Again here, Juror 8 represents the voice of Reginald Rose who's indicating what should happen, that questioning, rigorous questioning happens. I'm going to write that for you. Rigorous questioning should happen in a jury room. Um and the seventh juror says, look, you're not going to change anyone's mind. He asked, 11 of us still think he's guilty. You want to be stubborn. Hang this jury. Go ahead. And a hung jury is where they're unable to actually come to unanimous agreement. And then the seventh juror says, whoa, let's, anybody got, got a deck of cards? And, um, the tenth juror reveals some things about himself. Look, so what has this got to do with a knife? Somebody saw the kid. I got three garages of mine going to pot while you're talking. So he's a, he owns a garage. Let's get this done. Get out of here. So there's an urgency, a sense of brushing it off. And at page 26 is where we're going to end up in this video here. The eighth juror makes a proposition. He wants them to vote by secret written ballot and he will abstain so he's not going to vote here and he says if there's still 11 votes for guilty he's not going to stand alone he will change his vote and they'll take a guilty verdict into the judge but if anyone votes not guilty they'll stay and talk it out and so they agree they pass out the ballots and the eighth juror stands aside watching and they each begin to write they fold it up and the foreman opens them up, guilty, 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 and not guilty. And that point is where we're going to stop at the um, end of the second vote. And so somebody has actually changed their vote, but we don't know who yet.